Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon for um, this webinar, which is from the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce in partnership with the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunities Office of Trade and Investment. My name is Sarah Barnett. I'm the Vice President of Operations at the Chicagoland Chamber. I'm uh, pleased that you could join us today. Uh, our fellow uh, presenters will be Margo Markopoulos from the Office of Trade and Investment, and um, also Paul Jarzombek with LNR International, or LR International, sorry, Paul. Uh, just so that you know, at the, at the top of the program, I wanted you to be sure to know we are recording this, as well as if you have questions, please go ahead and use the Q&A. We, if the Q&A chat box function in the Zoom meeting. We will have time at the end of this for questions as well. Um, so, so you can put your questions in the box and we will address them at the end if we don't address them during our presentation itself. With that, I'll let Margo begin. Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, so happy to join you and to partner with the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce to present today's webinar. Um, last year, for those of you that may know, Illinois exported over $59 billion, making Illinois the, the fourth largest state in the United States. With a diverse economy and a strong global network, the state of Illinois has many resources to help small businesses succeed. As Sarah mentioned today, we're going to talk about the importance of export documentation. And we have uh, Paul with us from LR International, who's a great speaker, great partner, um, who will share best practices to help you through the export process and documentations um, that you would need to succeed. We're also excited that Sarah will be sharing a new digital tool that the Chicagoland Chamber has to offer, which is um, which can help you obtain a certificate of origin for your products. For several months, the state of Illinois has been assessing and addressing the challenges social distancing has imposed on our companies. We've seen trade shows and missions canceled all over the world, supply chains interrupted, and many businesses wondering how they'll be able to stay afloat. But even in these challenging times, lots of resources have been expended in the forms of grants and loans, um, as well as other tools to help local businesses at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, before I turn things over to Paul to talk about um, export documentation, I wanted to take a moment to share a little bit about the Office of Trade and Investment and the tools that we have to offer Illinois businesses. Uh, Office of Trade and Investment, otherwise known as OTI, is a bureau within the Illinois Department of Commerce. Our mission is to open international markets for companies and to promote foreign investment back to Illinois. With headquarters in Chicago and six offices in key markets around the world, OTI is dedicated to helping businesses achieve their international business development goals, thus helping to create and retain jobs here locally. Next slide, please. And one more. There we go. One more. Super, thank you. OTI works closely with the state um, and has international partners to support, support Illinois companies. Our partners include the Illinois Small Business Development Centers and International Trade Centers, which are located around the state and who offer businesses support at the local level, including helping companies create an export plan um, and identifying access to capital. Next slide, please. We work very closely also with our federal partners at the U.S. Commercial Service, um, SBA, XM Bank, and many others, um, including local and foreign chambers, uh, chambers such as Chicagoland Chamber, who we're partnering with today, as well as foreign consulates and governments. On the next slide, we'll talk about OTI's domestic and international staff offerings, which include market research, distribu distributor, agent, or partner searches, pre-vetted B2B matchmaking, trade show logistics support, and government advocacy. During a time where the need for social distancing has kept us away from trade shows, OTI has led 
efforts to bring Illinois companies to virtual trade shows and offers webinars such as this one today to help you grow international sales through e-commerce, website localization, and of course, lay the groundwork for future personal engagement. We typically lead a dozen or more foreign trade missions to key markets and major international trade shows annually, bringing Illinois companies face-to-face -face with agents, distributors, and partners, and we hope to be able to resume this activity very soon. Um, I know virtual offerings are great and we've all um, grown accustomed to them over the last few months, but it certainly doesn't substitute a face-to-face -face meeting. Next slide, please. Aside from our strong international network, which not only includes our six regional offices, but dozens of other partners around the globe, Illinois, uh, manages an Export Promotion Assistance Program, otherwise known as ISTEP, which I think many of you on the webinar today may be familiar with and have used. Qualified companies with financial reimbursements um, or can receive financial reimbursements to offset the cost of export promotion activities, which include booth space at major trade events, um, distributor searches, uh, and other such activities. Uh, we also offer business-to-business -business matchmaking support, website localization, and assistance for companies to achieve product compliance. Next slide, please. Companies that are interested in ISTEP, which is a program that runs on a, a rolling application basis, um, can apply through our office. Eligibility requirements include um, businesses must be one must be in business for at least one year and registered in the state of Illinois, must have fewer than 500 employees, 250 in annual revenues, and have products or services that contain at least 51% U.S. and 25% Illinois content, um, and be a company that's export ready. To apply for ISTEP or to learn more about our office, about the global network that Illinois has around the world um, and other resources, please feel free to contact us. Um, we have five regional trade specialists that are based in Chicago that are ready to assist you and help you to sell your products around the world. Um, that's just a quick introduction of our office. With that, I'd like to pass the mic back to Sarah so that we can uh, have Paul's presentation and learn more about export documentation. Thank you. Thanks, Margo. Mute. Um, now we're going to head over to hear from Paul and uh, so he can talk to you a little bit about export documentation and best practices. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Well, uh, thank you to um, Sarah and Margo, the Illinois Department of Commerce, uh, OTI, and the uh, Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you all who are uh, on this webinar for being here this afternoon. Um, we're glad you're here. We're hoping that the information will be uh, really uh, useful. I'm quite proud. I've lived in Illinois my entire life and our business is uh, in our 32nd year of operation here in Illinois. Quite proud of the team that we have in Illinois. Uh, there's a lot of resources available to you out there who are exporting. And um, <clears throat> you know, you, these, these are people that, um, what I have found in working with a lot of people around the country in similar roles, I have found that in Illinois, we have really a great depth of experience uh, available to us uh, from the different agencies, such as the Illinois Department of Commerce, OTI, and the Chicagoland Chamber. So I would definitely recommend <clears throat> that if you haven't had a chance to connect with the, uh, my colleagues and those professionals from those agencies, I would definitely do that because um, if you're struggling with an export issue, I have a feeling they uh, either have a solution or they have some partners, uh, companies like mine that they can reach out to and we get the solutions for you. So I highly recommend that. What I'm going to talk to you about uh, about over the next 30 minutes here is export documentation. <clears throat> and, um, you know, they say that uh, the, the, it's not over until the documents are done. Uh, and I would say that's true, but I would include it's not over until the documents are done right uh, or correctly. Um, and uh, any more today, that's especially true because in the export arena, um, things have really gotten, uh, from a documentation standpoint, a lot more complicated um, than they were 30 years ago when I 
started in this business. Now, a lot of that has become um, more um, streamlined in terms of e-documents and things like that. And um, I know a little bit later we're gonna we're gonna hear about um, an, an electronic certificate of origin offering, and there's a lot a lot of that happening um, in our industry and just around the world in terms of how documents are uh, passed and utilizing technology. And so that's exciting. It also comes with some challenges. My goal today, if you go to the next slide, Sarah, um, 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 the agenda here, I'm going to talk to you about the role of the freight forwarder. So my company is a freight forwarder and customs broker. We're headquartered uh, just two miles east of O'Hare Airport in Chicago. We have 14 North American facilities that we handle cargo for export and import in, uh, including in, in the US, Canada, and Mexico. And we have partners around the world in 130 plus countries uh, that do the same thing we do, uh, a network that we develop uh, where uh, those partners represent us in their country and we represent them here in the United States. Uh, when I'm talking to you today, I'm not really talking about my company. I'm talking really about the freight forwarding industry uh, and what role does a freight forwarder play uh, in the export process. And today in particular, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how a freight forwarder and an exporter, as well as carriers that move cargo around the world and customs agencies all over the world, uh, sort of overlap and interconnect when it comes to documents uh, that reflect uh, what's exactly in a shipment who the parties are in the transaction and, and so forth. So I hope to give you an idea of what role do we, the freight forwarder play. I'll probably also be telling you the role that we don't play uh, because there is some um, misconception at times I find with, with uh, customers that we will encounter about exactly what we, the freight forwarder, uh, are to do and what we're not to do. Um, and what responsibilities exporters have. We're gonna talk about export documentation, specifically the most common documents when exporting uh, and some not so common documents uh, and the best practices when generating those documents. Uh, little things mean a lot in documentation, especially in certain markets around the world. And so something you might view as um, unimportant when it comes to uh, an export document might just make all the difference in how quickly your shipment can be cleared through customs in that overseas country and delivered to your customer. And that's really what we're talking about here is how the documents facilitate the actual trade uh, movement of the cargo from the U.S. here to whatever country you're selling in. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to choose a freight forwarder. Best practices in looking at a freight forwarding partner. If you're exporting around the world, you need uh, a good freight forwarder or maybe a, a couple of good freight forwarders. Um, it's no sin to have more than one. Um, uh, freight forwarders like any other company are, are can't be good at everything. Um, some are good at a lot of things. Uh, some are really good at just a few things and that's their whole purpose, how they've uh, set up their company and marketed themselves and so forth. So talk to you a little bit about how to choose a freight forwarder and I'll let you know a little bit more about my company and what we do. Um, and um, I'm certainly available to you after this webinar if you have questions, uh, just academic information and so forth. Um, you know, you can certainly um, email or, or call me and my information will you know, appear at the end of this and that would be, uh, you know, no problem. So next slide, please. So the role of the freight forwarder, <clears throat> a freight forwarder, if you think of a travel agent, um, Back in the days when travel agents were a little bit more prevalent, today there's a lot of online uh, you know, opportunities when, when setting up travel. But really, the concept of a travel agent uh, booking a trip, a vacation for you maybe, and uh, letting you know the various things that will be required, not only from a, a documentation standpoint, but certainly from an immigration perspective and um, the scheduling of that trip. <clears throat> maybe you're going to travel here or there and take different modes of transport, trains and planes and buses, and um, travel agent would help someone make all of those arrangements. A freight forwarder does the same thing. Uh, we are a flexible extension to an exporter and their 
their team that is involved in export. We find with a lot of our clients, of course, they have domestic sales here in the United States. It's a very big market here. And um, <clears throat> usually they have robust domestic sales. Um, international and exporting often comes because they make a really cool product. People around the world want it and they find them. And uh, those customers of ours who hadn't exported before, um, maybe didn't even think that they would, but you know, the world's getting smaller. We all find each other and our in the products and um, <clears throat> you know, people are consuming those products. And so uh, since 90%, uh, 95% actually of the, of the world's consumers are outside of the United States, it makes sense for any business to at least um, you know, consider selling abroad. And uh, we as a freight forwarder, a flexible extension of that export team. We're also, however, an agent for carriers that we represent around the world. So we often say we serve two masters. One is the actual exporter or shipper, and we're there to help them make the arrangements to ship their goods and get them the best deal. But we also represent carriers, carriers like American Airlines or Maersk, the Danish uh, steamship line, or Japan Airlines, or trucking companies, or rail carriers, or other, other transportation companies. We're an agent for those carriers. Why do those carriers need agents? Well, those carriers specialize in moving the cargo. They don't specialize in all of the other things like documentation that it takes to do the job, to actually move that cargo. And so a carrier, such as American Airlines, as, as an example, um, would want you, the exporter, to have a freight forward. If you contact a, a cargo airline like American and you say, well, I want to ship something from here to London, they'll say, who's your freight forwarder? Because freight forwarders serve as an intermediary uh, and we bring business to those carriers. In turn, we have preferential treatment when it comes to space and rates. So we need those carriers and you as an exporter do too, but we also need you, the exporters, because you make the stuff or you supply it or source it, and that's the stuff we ship. So it's a triangular relationship between the exporter, their freight forwarder, and the carriers that serve the world. Uh, we're a logistics planning partner. Uh, we wanna be part of your plan well before you're executing a shipment. Uh, yes, we can handle the freight when it's on the dock ready to go and you contact us, but we prefer to be talking with you about that order well in advance of when it's ready on the dock because we may, through our experience and our network around the world, be able to give you some valuable information about whether it's documents or how you're going to get paid for your, your shipment, your, your order. Um, all those things we should be planning with you in advance of the shipment being ready to go. We often say in our business, the actual shipping or, or moving of the freight is the easy part. Um, it, it's all the other stuff, including the documentation that you're usually trying to do in advance to make that transaction um, feel easy. That's our job is to help you feel like exporting is uh, no big deal. Um, and, and, and hopefully if we do it right, you know, we do that. Uh, we know a lot about the export process and we interact with a lot of different uh, entities, whether that be, you know, your, your uh, state government assistance centers, such as, you know, the Illinois Department of Commerce and OTI and, and the Chicago Land Chamber, or we are working with the federal equivalent on uh, the Department of Commerce or the Export Import Bank or the SBA, Small Business Administration, as well as banks and attorneys and, and um, uh, accounting firms. Uh, we're, so we're sort of the conduit to all those different parties that make up your team, you the exporter, your team. Uh, to get export um, transactions done in an in a efficient manner. Certainly problem solvers, that's probably what we spend most of our day doing is uh, solving problems. Uh, we're a liaison between you, the exporter, and other service providers, as I mentioned, banks and, and, and other you know, service providers. If you go to the next slide. Again, a little bit more about the role of the freight forwarder. Certainly moving cargo is a core competency for us shipping and, and, and booking space and looking at transit times and what are the cutoffs and how do we, how do we back into when you have the cargo ready and, uh, and what the deadline is to deliver to the customer. Uh, documentation assistance, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about here today. Uh, and certainly a freight forwarder is uh, very familiar with the documents that are required to export anywhere. 
Uh, one of the things that I'll tell you just a little bit later is ultimately you, the exporter, are responsible for all of your documents. There isn't a document that a freight forwarder completes that is only their document, uh, not even the transport document, because if you, the exporter, are the shipper on that transport document, uh, you bear some joint responsibility for everything that's and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So it's important to know that while your freight forward can absolutely help you with documentation and should help you with documentation, um, ultimately you, the exporter, are the uh, are the either the sole responsible party or you're sharing responsibility for certain documents. We as a forwarder in, uh, engage in a lot of different trade terms for clients. And one of the things we're always asking clients is how are you going to get paid? That's, that's a major concern of ours and it certainly should be a concern of yours. Uh, and we look at that situation and back into it typically when we advise clients on risk um, uh, with regard to an export transaction. And so international payment assistance, guidance, consulting, we're doing a lot of that. Um, risk mitigation is another big thing that we uh, get involved with as a freight forwarder and all freight forwarders do. Um, you know, I'd like to say that uh, shipments just go wonderfully and carriers are very careful with your freight and uh, it's a utopic experience, but it's not. Carriers are not careful. Things go wrong all the time. So cargo insurance and risk mitigation is something we talk a lot with clients about because um, going into exporting with your eyes wide open uh, critically important. Um, it's, it's uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, it's a screwed up world and uh, we have to adjust. And so part of our job is to help you do that. Um, we do warehousing and distribution, consolidations and assembly both here and around the world. What does that mean basically? Well, the freight forwarding industry is, is part of that 3PL, um, if you may have heard that, that 3PL process where you can, to some degree, outsource some of the backroom handling of cargo, especially for international, to a freight forwarder. Uh, and that warehousing, those warehousing services can be everything from packing and crating to uh, pick and pack services to um, um, inventory management, uh, short and long-term storage and, and things of that nature. So we do a lot of that as well. Next slide, please. So getting into the documentation side of things, and that's one of the things that a forwarder is quite involved with. You know, there's quite a bit of documentation with some export markets that you will uh, export to. Uh, and then to some others, the documentation requirements are a little bit less. Some key things you should think about when you're exporting is, no matter where you're exporting in the world, there's some fundamental things that have to be addressed. What is it that you're exporting? How, how is it described? Is, do you have the appropriate tariff code, which is a numbering system that identifies those commodities all over the world, regardless of language or custom or, or what have you? Um, what is the value of what you're exporting? And how is that value determined on the other side for your customer who's importing it into their country? And what is the country of origin or better stated, the country of manufacture? Um, where, where are the goods made? And in today's economy, that can be a combination of places or origins, and it's important to define uh, where those goods are made because there are many uh, free trade agreements that many countries have with each other all over the world. And if it's not a free trade agreement, there, there, are, there are bilateral and even multilateral agreements that provide preferential treatment to goods made uh, in certain places. These are countries that want to do more business with each other, want to trade more, and have come to an agreement of one sort or another to do that. And there are many all over the world. The United States alone is involved in, I think it's 22 free trade agreements uh, you know, around the world. So um, identifying your commodity and having the correct tariff code, valuation, and then country of origin or country of manufacture, critical points. Um, Many of the documents are very common in export transactions, commercial invoices, packing lists. A commercial invoice details what you're selling and what you're selling it for, what it's made of. Uh, a description can be simple or 
rather complex, actually. Packing list usually refers to how it's being shipped. So you might sell a thousand widgets, but they're all packed in one box because they're really small. So the packing list uh, might just say in that case, one box with the dimensions and the weight and some marks and um, marks meaning things that are on, on the outside of that package, et cetera, et cetera. Certificates of origin are documents that relate to that country of manufacture issue that I mentioned. Typically countries around the world want you, the exporter, to declare formally what the country of origin or country of manufacture is for your product. And that'll often be in the form of a certificate of origin. And a little bit later in this presentation, there's going to be some cool information about uh, electronic delivery of certificates of origin. So we'll, we'll look forward to that. Shipper's letter of instruction is a document between the exporter and the freight forwarder, giving that freight forwarder not only instruction about the shipment, but also uh, defining the description and tariff code and value and all these things I've been mentioning about the shipment or the product. And also letting the freight forwarder as well as the U.S. federal government know that the shipment, let's say, does not have any restrictions in the form of export licenses and things of that nature. Uh, insurance certificates and transport documents are kind of as they say. The transport document is that document that relates to the actual movement of the cargo, airway bill or ocean bill of lading, truck bill of lading, that sort of thing. Uh, insurance certificates are when the goods are insured, there's a document that proves that they're insured. Uh, some specialized documents, um, again, when there are free trade agreements, there's usually specific certificates of origin that relate to those free trade agreements. So back in the day, it was the NAFTA certificate of origin. Now we have the USMCA uh, certificate of origin and other free trade agreements like with Australia or Israel or Korea. Um, you know, we have these agreements out there. In some cases, there are specific certificates of origin that relate to those trade agreements. Um, other specialized documents, carnets are a, uh, are a that allows goods to not go through a formal customs process in the destination country, usually related to things like trade shows or a temporary import of those goods into that foreign country for demonstration purposes or things of that nature. Big users of carnets are sports teams. When they go, let's say, from the U.S. to Canada, all their gear uh, isn't really being consumed in Canada. They're using it for the games that they're going to be playing up there. And uh, carnets are a way to let uh, Revenue Canada, the Canadian Customs Service, know that uh, this stuff is not staying in Canada. When the team leaves, the sporting equipment's going to leave. That sort of thing. Uh, things like certificates of quality or beneficiary certificates, those are very specialized requests from customers that want to know a little bit more about the product, or it might be specific to certain products. Um, and export licenses, of course, the US government um, has certain restrictions on certain commodities and to some areas of the world, or even certain individuals or companies around the world. Uh, and you have to seek permission from the United States government in order to export to either that country, uh, to that customer, or because of your actual product, uh, and licenses are granted in the, in the form of permission from our government in order for you to uh, make those exports. So in common documents that we see with every export, and there's also some specialized documents that are not uh, present with every export, but are there with uh, some exports. So in, uh, in a first order, you know, I won't say we've seen every document, we've seen and done it all, but I would say that um, if you're working with a good freight forwarder, they've probably seen and done most everything as it relates to documentation. So if you're confused, they should be able to help you. Again, a real key is to be working with your freight forwarder early in the process. Um, if we're at the 11th hour and there's a documentation problem, no matter how good the forwarder is, it's going to be hard to fix something you know at that point so good to cover that uh in advance uh, I, we go to the next slide again a little bit more about documentation you've got the common document uh, documents you've also got the um sort of a little bit more exotic uh, documents there are also documents that are generated by a third party that neither you the exporter nor your freight forwarder have any real jurisdiction over 
Um, these can be difficult not only to get, but also to control uh, the exact content of those documents. That can be a little problematic because again, you're relying on a third party to issue a document in some cases in a very specific way with very specific wording and it can be challenging. So you wanna be careful when those documents that are generated by a third party are infused into a, an export order that you're working on. You, you've gotta ask yourself, do we think we can actually get this document and can we get it in time? And if the answer is no, or we're scratching our head, we don't think so, um, you might want to try to negotiate the document out of the process, if at all possible. Some examples would be um, some documents have to be legalized, that is approved and stamped by an embassy of a foreign government here in the United States. We see this a lot in the Middle East and in some countries in Latin America. And uh, it's essentially the first step in that country's customs clearance process and their embassy here in the United States, typically in either Washington or Houston, places like that. They review the documents and they add their certification in the form of stamps to those documents, which are then sent overseas to the customer who can use them with their custom service uh, to clear goods in their country. So it's, it's a rather involved process. Um, Inspection reports and carrier certificates. Some countries, uh, a, a good one is Saudi Arabia. They typically require a SASO inspection. Uh, inspections, certainly with some products uh, that fall under a category similar to our UL Underwriters Laboratory category here in the United States. They'll require inspections of those products here in the US before the, the goods ever shipped to Saudi Arabia. Uh, that inspection is um, a little bit cumbersome to schedule. Um, of course, there's some timing associated with it, and then there are reports that are generated, and uh, those reports are critical to the actual customs clearance process in Saudi Arabia or other countries that require this. Um, export licenses, I mentioned, uh, that's something that the U.S. government issues um, or not. Uh, when you ask for permission, um, uh, it'll either be granted or it won't, and if it's not granted, then you actually can't make that export um, in that situation. When you're, when you're exporting under certain um, uh, unique circumstances, such as a letter of credit, uh, if you're, maybe this is the first time you're exporting to a customer, you wanna make sure you're gonna get paid, or when you're insuring your receivable internationally, and you can do that, you can, you can buy insurance um, when you sell to a customer somewhere around the world, and you're maybe a little concerned about being paid, um, you can, you can buy insurance that will uh, protect you, but there are documents that have to be provided both in the case of a letter of credit or in the case of uh, receivables or trade credit insurance. Um, and those documents have to be right. Um, and if they're not, then your payment could be in jeopardy. So that's also something where a freight forwarder can, can assist you, you know, with those specialized documents. You can go to the next slide. This is a graphic that sort of um, lays it out for you, um, including a lot of the typical documents that, that would um, frame out uh, an transaction. You can see you, the exporter, uh, there in the center here in the United States, um, have overlapping responsibility for just about everything. Um, now, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to generate every one of those documents, although many of them, you, the exporter, would be generating. Uh, but again, there's some overlap there with your freight forwarder and even your customer overseas. Uh, and then some things that your freight forwarder and your customer overseas do that are independent of you, the exporter. And so it's important to know your role, but I, I would say don't let this graphic overwhelm you like, holy smokes, I don't want to do this. Um, you know, if you are in need of assistance, that's where you have to have that relationship with your freight forwarder. And that's just critical to saying, okay, look, I, you know, we, as a regular course of business, we generate some of these things, but some of them we don't. Do we need them? And if we do, how do we do it? How can you help us? And uh, your freight forwarder will help you. That's, that's what freight forwarders are there for. Okay, next slide. So in speaking about that, how do you choose a freight forwarder? Um, you know, there's these various documents that are required and it's different for every, you know, different places around the world. Your freight forwarder is your partner, both in logistics planning, obtaining rates and schedules and space, 
uh, but also helping you understand how to create certain documents that are required and in some cases creating them themselves, you need a good freight forwarder or a couple. How do you do it? Well, like most vendors, it comes down to uh, things like um, what size is that freight forwarder related uh, in relation to you, the exporter, in relation to your business? You know, if you if you have uh, if you have a thousand export transactions a week and you're working with a freight forwarder that's very very small, it might just be too much. It just might be too much work for them. Um, by the same token, if you have two export transactions a year and you're working with a very very large freight forwarder, it might not be enough for them to uh, give you the kind of attention that, that you need. So size, certainly global coverage, most freight forwarders can handle cargo all over the world, uh, but uh, the, the um, depth of their network and the length of time they've been working with their partners is pretty critical. Um, again, that specialized versus volume oriented freight forwarders come in all shapes and sizes. So um, it's important to ask a lot of questions. Um, of course, like with any vendor, you want to have a um, you want to feel like you've struck a good relationship. Um, your freight forwarder, in some ways, is is kind of like your attorney. Um, everything you say with them kind of stays with them, and you need to talk through the transaction to figure out um, if something needs to change, uh, and they should be ready to you know give you advice along those lines. Um, if you are forced by a customer to work with their freight forwarder and it's not your freight forwarder, there are some important things that you will want to get from that freight forwarder that is your customs, uh, your customer's vendor to make sure that they're adhering to U.S. Export Administration regulations on your behalf. Um, I'm not going to go into that today, but uh, my contact information will be at the end of the presentation here. And if you're interested in the kinds of things you should be getting from that customer's freight forward, I'd be happy to, you know, send you an email with, um, I, I've got a document that sort of lays that out. So uh, the next slide, please. So just to recap, um, you know, we talked a little bit about what freight forwarders do being a, a, a planning partner, uh, much like a, a travel agent, but for cargo instead of for people. And we get involved as a, a conduit with a lot of your service providers, including attorneys and, and, and um, you know, accountants and banks and, and uh, any, any vendor or provider of yours that helps you export. We tend to be kind of the glue that brings all those partners together. Um, there, we talked a little bit about the common documents and the not so common documents that might require, be required for exporting and third party documents that are issued um, by a third party that uh, you have a little bit less control over. And we talked a little bit about choosing an experienced freight forwarder and um, making sure that it's a relationship. You should be meeting with your forwarder. In the COVID world here, it's a little difficult, but connecting with them, I would say at least once a quarter. And uh, if you're a pretty active exporter, maybe even a little bit more than that, because things really do change around the world rapidly. And um, it's a good idea for you to be connecting with your freight forwarder, also giving them feedback on how shipments and processes have been going. Like any business, a freight forwarder wants to improve, and we're certainly not uh, infallible. Uh, and so it's a relationship. And uh, I think that's you know, really the, the key point. Uh, the last slide here is just my contact information, a little bit about our company. I am proud to say that we're a two-time Illinois Governor's E Award winner here in the state. And we, that really means a lot to us. We've also won a couple of times on the federal level, but being an Illinois company and myself being a native of Illinois since birth, um, we're, kind of, we're kind of proud of that. So uh, thank you again to the Illinois Department of Commerce, OTI and the Chicagoland Chamber for having me and I'd be happy to help anybody further if they need it. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Paul. That was a lot of great information and congrats on being an export award winner for the state and at the federal level. Um, so now we'll turn it over to the section about the Chicagoland Chamber and how we can help you in your exporting. Uh, just a little bit of background on the Chamber. The Chicagoland Chamber has been the leading voice of, voice of business in the Chicagoland area since 1904. Uh, we have over a thousand members representing a variety of industries and um, 
we focus on three main pillars at the chamber. Networking, which is which is probably an obvious one um, for chambers. It had networking has taken on um, a different look and feel since the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. However, our membership team has done a great job of thinking creatively and uh, providing some very positive networking experiences for our members. Um, the second pillar is advocacy. We um, are always advocating on behalf of of business uh, at the city, state, county levels. We are active um, <clears throat> in, in, at all levels of government and making sure that your voice is heard. Um, the third area is thought leadership um, in our programming. And this is one example, today's, today's webinar, of, of the thought leadership that we provide at the chamber. Um, but we also have some other some other programs that target the mid-market uh, businesses, as well as some industry-specific um, technology and healthcare programming. Um, basically, you'd be able to find <clears throat> relevant programming for most businesses. Um, we also are a, and, and Margo mentioned this earlier, but, but the Chicago Chamber is a small business development center as well. So we have staff dedicated to helping small businesses They've been quite busy these days, um, but we are expanding our SBDC footprint and um, look forward to helping some more folks and we can get you some more information if need be. Um, <clears throat> you can go to the next slide. So we also provide the electronic uh, certificates of origin that Paul mentioned are necessary for Exporting. Now, chambers are the, are the only ones who provide these certificates of origin, and the Chicagoland Chamber is one of only two chambers in uh, Illinois that provide this service. So, <clears throat> a lot of people right now might be going to, or might have been going to their local chambers who perhaps aren't open um, or don't have physical presence right now, uh, but we, ha we are doing this online. It's a very simple process. And I'm going to show you this quick video that explains how you can register and how easy it is to obtain a certificate of work. So you can go ahead and press play, Lily. Okay. So thousands of companies use this product to digitize their trade and export documents. The certificate of origin process is easy. First, you apply online. And then your application comes to the chamber where we review it on our side of the SCERT um, portal and we approve it and then you will be notified and you can print it yourself uh, as a PDF and you can get e-verification for customs, banks, and other relevant parties. So this is the, the portal that you'd be using. You log in and you use the active applications page as your main control panel. You select certificate of origin and then you're on your way. You enter basic information about your shipment. Select a consignee or add a new one. Select your country of origin and enter your transport method. You can also enter in some special uh, comments specific to you, um, as well as save some of this text for you to use at a later time. <clears throat> and then finally, you enter the details about shipment quantities.
you go ahead and submit it and it uploads to the chamber. Now here we only do the, uh, we, the Chicago Land Chamber will not print certificates for you. It, it, you'll only be given the option within our portal to print it yourself once the chamber has approved it. You pay with your credit card and you can save it for, save it on file to use in the future. It really is a simple process. You'll receive instant notification once we approve your certificate. And you can see that you can go ahead and print your certificate of origin. And it's ready pretty much instantaneously after we approve it. There's an archive within the system so that you can uh, use, you can look back onto your past shipments and it's one easy place to find them all. Um, as well as a data library to help you with reporting tools. Uh, so you can sort it in different ways and help you with management of your exporting. You can also use it to add other users so that you have multiple folks at your company um, who are using it. And then you log out. Now the Chicagoland Chamber is not accredited by the International Chamber of Commerce. However, that's not a problem because SCERT, uh, the vendor provides full tax verification for the Chicagoland Chamber through certificateoforigin.com. And then finally, there's options for other, uh, for frequent exporters and forwarders that include interfacing with your corporate systems, the ability to extract data from your invoices, um, a freight forwarder module allowing forwarders to support an unlimited, unlimited number of exporters through multiple forwarder stations and the ability to upload pre-formatted certificates. So that's just a brief overview of kind of how the process would work in order to, to get a um, certificate of origin. Uh, Lily can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this, is, this is how you access the portal through our website, which is chicagolandchamber.org. Um, you'll get a more specific link at, at the end of this, but we charge $25 per certificate if you are a member of the Chicagoland Chamber. It's $75 per certificate if you're not a member. Um, so there's value in membership and, um, I, and um, you know, we'd be happy to discuss that with you. You can go to the next slide. Um, I'm happy to discuss membership specifics. I think there's a few people on this uh, webinar today, but also we have more information about our, our future upcoming events. Um, as well as the SCERT documentation process. As you can see, my contact information is listed here, as well as the very specific link to sign up for SCERT at the bottom of the slide. Um, so thank you very much, and we'll open it up to Q&A. I see there's, only, there's one question in the chat box. Um, Oh, okay, it looks like Margo answered it and, and Paul. So uh, I want to start to import export, where do I begin? Margo and Paul, do you wanna address that for the group or do you just wanna let that one? Well, what I'll say, uh, this is Paul, uh, I'll, you know, 
Wisconsin was a really good place to start if you're just first getting started is, you know, use the state resources that are that are out there. So the Illinois Department of Commerce and, and Margo at the uh, Illinois Office of Trade and Investment, as well as Sarah in the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce, as I mentioned at the beginning of my comments, a lot of uh, uh, very experienced people here in the state of Illinois. And I would say if you're just getting started, uh, go there first. And then what they will do is they will connect you with uh, not only practitioners for export, uh, the various disciplines, and there are, there are a few for sure, as well as even on the federal side, because um, there's, there's also a sort of a federal equivalent to this uh, and some good programs. So if you're just getting started, you know, the best place to go is to those resources here in the state of Illinois that are already available to you. And, uh, you know, Margo and Sarah would be good, good places to start. Thanks, Paul, for that uh, testimonial. And yes, I would certainly add that we do have um, resources out in the field as well. So depending on where you're located, Sarah mentioned that the chamber was an SBDC. We have a number of international trade centers as well that are located around the state of Illinois that can really help focus on helping develop an export plan or um, access to capital. So we really do spend a lot of time walking through a company's needs and the resources that are available through not only, as Paul mentioned, the state, but also our partners um, with local government and federal government and uh, private partners as well. Great. <clears throat> we had a couple of others. Um, um, Paul, what would you say, what country or several countries would you say have the toughest documentation requirements for exporters? Well, that's a good question. I mean, there's, there's some that are pretty easy, like exporting to, uh, let's say, the UK or you know, a place like Germany or, or actually even China, although China is starting to get a little more complicated these days, mainly because of the sort of tit for tat, not so great relationship that the US has with China on trade right now, but historically anyway, not that terrible. As far as the most difficult ones, I mean, the, the first one that pops to mind is Brazil. Um, I would say Brazil probably has uh, the toughest import requirements of any country in the world. And um, if you're an exporter exporting to Brazil, uh, there, there are, quite a few things with regard to the documentation that you have to do that that are well beyond normal, I would say, uh, in order to make that process in Brazil smooth. Uh, India is a rather difficult uh, country because in India, uh, importers there, customers that you might have there have to obtain import permits when they import. They have to get permission from their government to import. Uh, and when they do that, these, these specifications laid out in the permit are how the transaction has to occur. But often the U.S. exporter is not aware of every little nuance of that import permit. And so the question is, does your transaction and the documents associated with it actually match that permit perfectly? And often the answer is no. So India can be difficult. Russia is another very difficult market with very specific requirements on documents that are not typical. So if I was to name three, Brazil, India, and Russia, and there are others, but those, are, those come right to mind. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what would you say is the single most important attribute for a freight, a freight forwarder should have that would make them a go-to choice for someone who is looking to export? Well, it depends on your exact product. So um, uh, I would say the key attribute is flexibility. Uh, you, you want an organization that's able to adjust depending on your situation. You know, as a freight forwarder, we deal with all types of companies, manufacturers of all sorts of things. Uh, think about anything you interact with on a daily basis probably had some export or import aspect associated with it, especially today. Um, and so um, different commodities require flexibility on the part of the freight forwarder. There are, if you're, if you're in a, a very specific business, maybe in the chemical business um, and you uh, ship in bulk, 
Uh, there are freight forwards that specialize in that sort of thing. And I would say in that kind of a situation, it's not a bad idea to pick a freight forwarder that specializes in that. Um, if you're moving uh, refrigerated goods that have to be kept refrigerated or cold, frozen, uh, there are freight forwarders that specialize in that. And again, uh, they would probably be a good choice compared to one that maybe doesn't specialize in that. So flexibility as a general rule, and then looking at what your particular commodity needs are. And I would say just ask a lot of questions. Uh, don't be afraid to ask a lot of questions uh, of your potential freight forwarder that you may be looking to choose. Okay, we just got another question. We frequently get our shipments stopped at customs. How can we avoid this? <clears throat> Well, where do I begin? Sorry, I was on mute there. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, that's that's one of the big things. You know, preparing a shipment here and packing it up and uh, sort of manufacturing it correctly, and even the documents and the export process here in the United States is not too bad. Where the rubber really meets the road is when the shipment gets overseas and uh, it has to clear customs in that foreign country. And and once it does clear customs in that foreign country. Uh, then the delivery to your customer is back on the easy side of things. And so probably the single toughest part about an export transaction, if all those other things are equal, is the actual customs clearance process overseas. There are many things that can affect it, but I will tell you this. If you're pretty consistently having a holdup uh, in the customs clearance process, I feel like there's something about those foundational issues that is a miss. Foundational issues meaning classification. What are you shipping and are you declaring it correctly as far as the tariff code and the description? Valuation, how is it being valued and how do your documents lay out that value so it's clear to the customs service overseas? And uh, country of origin or country of manufacture, usually when there's a problem with a customs clearance overseas, um, it will have something to do with one of those three things. Uh, and then of course, the proofs in the documents. So I would say if, you've, if you're having a consistent recurring issue, um, certainly get with your freight forward. If you're looking for an independent opinion, uh, you can contact me and I'll, I'll weigh in um, just with an academic response and, um, and you can see what you think. But usually it's something of one of those three foundational issues. Okay. Uh, someone asked where they can get a fillable copy of the new USMCA form. Yeah, there's a lot of that going around because as of July 1st, um, you know, that's uh, sort of the form now. Um, there, there are a lot of similarities between NAFTA and the USMCA uh, and, and the structure of that form. Um, the form, you can search it online and find it. Um, my office has it, so if you want, after this presentation, just shoot me a quick email and we'll send you uh, a template of that form. It's not uh, very, um, it's not well distributed in the system as of right now. So sort of the deadline kind of came and everybody was like, where's that form, you know? And it wasn't, we, I guess, there wasn't a good job of distributing that in advance, I guess. So again, you can either search it online, it is actually out there, or uh, email me and I'll send you the form. Okay, <clears throat> we had one more question and then I think uh, we're, we've hit our time, but someone asked if they can import too. Yeah, so I think that was tied to the original question about getting started to export. And um, okay. you know what you wanna know there is in this country, in the United States, um, you know, we have a great situation in that you can be an exporter and an importer very easily. Uh, there are only a few things that you need to do, not many at all. If you're a company and you have a tax ID number, that EIN or tax ID number is going to be the identifier for you as an exporter or an importer. And it's gonna be driven through kind of the federal system in, in both directions. Um, on the import side, having an import bond in place with US Customs, which is like an insurance policy is, is an important um, piece as well. That's about all you need to be an importer or an exporter. So depending on the commodity, of course, that you're exporting or importing, because things like food related pr products and so forth, they have other federal requirements under FDA or USDA or whatever. But as a general rule, 
if you if you're an exporter actually you're probably an importer because at some point someday it might be returned to you and if it's returned to you from another country it's an import and you're an importer so tax id number a bond on the import side and then a good freight forwarder or customs broker along with reaching out to the state and federal resources that you have uh trade centers and the like are all you really need to be to be an, an importer along with being an exporter Margo, do you have anything you want to add before we sign off? Um, just as far as that last question about importers, if I would just only add, um, state resources are expended to exporting Illinois manufactured goods or services outbound. So through the I-STEP program and others, I know sometimes there is a question about um, actual financial resources through the state or through the federal government that can be applied towards bringing products and importing products in. We don't have something like that, um, but as Paul pointed out, typically we do have many of our exporters that are importing some product that is um, going to be a component, let's say, to uh, something that they're going to be exporting. So certainly in that regard, we can help um, identify, um, you know, through the supply chain opportunities that may be able to help a company. <clears throat> okay, great. And somebody asked about um, our contact information. So, Lou, I think that's on one of the earlier slides. Um, Lily, if you wouldn't mind putting that back up. There you go. Um, and I think Paul's was on the other, uh, on an earlier slide. Um, but happy to be in touch and we will post this uh, recording on our Chicagoland Chamber website with all of our other webinars. So you can reference it again. Thank you um, to Margo and Paul and the events team, uh, Lily at, at the Chicagoland Chamber for putting this on and also Lauro at, at the Office of Trade and Investment. It's been a pleasure. And hopefully we can do this again soon. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your partnership. Thanks, everyone. Great. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.